Hello, everyone. Uh, we are gathered here for the second time to uh, talk about the energy efficiency in pneumatic systems. Uh, today, we'll be talking more about uh, optimizations and savings. The, on the last part, we, we focused more um, on uh, air generation and what we can do globally for our system. But in today's part, we'll talk about local actions that we can um, make even right now uh, going back to work back to our plant to to create at least some savings that in time will um, generate um, money saved for uh, for the company so going straight in the easiest thing to do but which is very, um, once again, hiding in plain, in plain sight. The easiest thing to do is just to turn off the machines that are not being used. <laughs> um, time and time again, when we uh, perform audits with, uh, with our clients, uh, we are seeing machines that are idle, uh, but are still working. Either uh, they are pressurized, um, this is, not that bad because then only the leakages work in the machine and we lose only some of the air but at, at we, uh, as we can see in the left picture in this machine um, there was a cooling and blowing application which was uh, wasting hundreds of liters per minute uh, for quite a long time because uh, the whole part uh, in the in the plant wasn't used so whenever we see whenever we know that the machine is not going to be used and we have to remember that downtime on the machine is not only the planned downtime that we know that we are not going to use the machine for a week during a year downtime on the machine is the every minute that the machine is not working for us so even if we uh, go away for the night. We walk two, work two shifts and we can turn off the machine at the third shift. We should do it. If the machine has um, high air consumption, then even uh, turning it off during lunch break can provide uh, quite substantial serving, uh, savings. So we have to remember, we have to uh, keep it in mind that not only uh, regard, regarding the air consumption, but also the electricity. Uh, when we are not using the machines, we should turn them, uh, turn them off. It seems obvious, but then we have to keep our eyes open because it's very popular for the whole plant to be, to be working even when, when it's not used. To cut off the air, we can use manual valves or automatic. Of course, we recommend automatic valves because it's not creating unnecessary pressures between the uh, workers and the company. Uh, when it's when something is um, automatic, it's always um, safer to, uh, to 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 perform. But then on the on the other hand, Festo has quite a nice product which I which I like which is an E2M station. So it's uh, energy efficiency module, E2M. Uh, the module, when we plug it into the machine, will um, be programmed in such a way that after a time when the production stops and we can program how long the time will take, uh, the pressure will be lowered. So it can be cut off completely down to zero and it can be um, lowered to, uh, once again, a set level. For example, we need two bars for um, ceiling applications to be, uh, to be powered. So the um, unit can actually lower the pressure to the, to the desired level um, and we can, we can be safe uh, that we are not wasting energy that is not being used. We are only using the part that is actually um, important for us. The other thing that the module can do for us is when it is closed, it will look for leakages. So 
once again, we can set a level which is acceptable for us. And if the module will sense the leakages level higher than the one programmed, it's going to uh, inform us, it's going to um, send us an alert. So very important, turn off machines that we are not using, either automatically or manually. Second point, which we were already talking about, is reduction of cable length. So when we are talking about it in the production zone, we are talking about pressure drop and unnecessary costs for the tubing that we are not using. And exactly the same we can do locally when we are using too long connections to our cylinders, to our, to our actuators. And it's exactly the same situation. Once again, we have pressure drops, we have unnecessary cost for the tubing, but in here, super important is that we have compressed air storage, which is emptied whenever the cylinder moves. Because once we are powering one side, the, uh, uh, in few seconds we are powering the other sides when the uh, first one is open. So the whole volume of air that we have just pumped into the hose, we are losing with every single movement. So whenever we have a situation when we can <clears throat> install a terminal um, closer to the actuators, we should actually do it. In this situation, we have quite a lot of tubing in uh, in here because the the valve is the valve terminal is in the control cabinet but if we mm, make the valve terminal closer we can reduce the tubing significantly so once again lower the pressure drop and save some money for us in the extreme situation uh, for uh, when it comes to shortening the tube lengths, we ha we have mm, components that can be mounted straight on the actuator. So in here, uh, what is also quite quite important, the response time of the actuator is going to be shorter. So the frequency that we use can be higher. Yes. So we don't have to wait for the whole tube to be pressurized, uh, it's actually happening instantly. It's um, the, the response time of the, of the actuator is very low. And to, uh, to show it in, um, in numbers, uh, here is an uh, MRI scanner, uh, which is um, powered by uh, cylinders of uh, 32 millimeters size and with a stroke of 250 millim millimeters and the hose got shortened 10 times from 3 meters to 0.3 meters. So during the operation the cylinder will use around two and a half liters per cycle so this is around 270 euro uh, but the hose will consume exactly proportional volume to the length of it yes so 10 times less um, air that we have to pump into it so for a year instead of 360 euro we have to pay 275 for the operation of this one cylinder so this is easy saving of 23 percent what else can we do about actuators? Usually when we use them, we care about movement in one direction. We have to make it with proper time, proper force. Uh, but when we are going the other way, it's uh, quite usual for, for, for us not to really care about how the movement is going to happen. So we can easily lower the pressure of the backstroke 
and create savings there. To achieve su such a um, such a situation, we can of course use pressure regulators. We can use valves we have which have a pressure regulator that can create two pressure zones. Yes, so one way we have uh, six bars and the other way we have four or less. So as we can see on the right side, uh, once again, if we are using our cylinder uh, with six bar on the retraction and on the backstroke, uh, we are using 5.1 liters per cycle. If we are using the same cylinder with the lowered pressure on the backstroke, we are using four liters for one stroke. So once again, another saving of 22%. So this is very easy steps that when we accumulate them, create quite a lot of uh, savings all, all together. We don't have really have to use the new type of uh, valves. We can, of course, use the old type of valves and another pressure regulator for the, for the backstroke. Here is a result of um, an exercise on uh, on a training when we are um, using um, me and measuring the actuators that we um, make more efficient during the during the exercise. So from starting consumption of uh, 80 to uh, 82 euro. Per, uh, per year for operation. We are going steps and steps again, reducing the pressure, reducing the tube length, regulating uh, the uh, return, return uh, stroke pressure. And we can al uh, almost achieve a situation when we, when, which we would have while using a single acting um, cylinder single acting so we have to pressurize only one way and the other stroke is um, powered by a by a spring so once again we have we can achieve a situation when we can have savings of more than 50 percent in very easy steps so we have to once again keep our eyes open find the points where we could make those uh, savings and to perform them. They, they are not expensive tax, tasks to do and the return on investment is just gen generating uh, month after month savings for us. So we make the action once and then we just collect the savings. Another thing to consider is uh, choosing between pneumatic and electric drives uh, in our applications. So which is better? Is it pneumatic or is it electric? So it is highly dependable because all of the systems have their very big strength and mm, quite um, connected to them weaknesses. So the biggest strength of the electric drive is that it's super dynamic and that we have complete control when it comes to the operating profile. We can go to when, whichever position that we uh, like with the speed that we want uh, and with the smoothness of the, uh, of the movement exactly how we like it. But on the other hand, we have re relatively high acquisition costs and quite complex uh, system design. On the other hand, we have quite simple and inexpensive, easy, durable, reliable pneumatic drives. But in here, the energy consumption that we have is strictly related to the air generation that we do in our system. So to know how much it's going to cost us, we have to have quite a lot of information about our air generation. We can of course use the uh, average values, but we have to think about our compressor room, about our, our air system, 
how is it, uh, how healthy is it uh, to uh, to actually calculate the cost of using the pneumatic drives. So, if you are thinking about um, buying a new drive, you have to ask yourself a few questions. So, are I, am I going to do more tasks except clamping or holding? Do I need long strokes, high speeds, or short cycles? Do I need more than three positions to be achieved? Uh, do I need um, flexible um, operation profile? Yes. Do, do I actually uh, want smooth motion or I don't care if the motion is going to um, <coughs> happen quite, uh, quite fast, quite jerky? So if we answer to any of the questions yes, that means that we need an electric drive or a servo pneumatic. But if we can answer no to all of the questions, then we can actually think of using pneumatic drive. And if we can use pneumatic drive, it doesn't mean we should. We, we absolutely have to instantly. Uh, if we can use pneumatic drive, that means that we have to compare it with the electric drive uh, and look at something called TCO, which is total cost of ownership. So we have to take in regard the buying cost, the using cost, and we should think about the disposal of the uh, unit, but they are quite similar. So in here, we are not going to talk about this. But with an application of uh, YZ country, moving at 1. seconds a, uh, a cycle, 24 hours a day, 360 uh, days per year, with the average costs of electricity and compressed air. What do we get? We see that after a little bit more than two and a half years, the pneumatic sol solution, despite of the lower investment cost, is the energy consumption is going to make uh, the application more expensive. So after two and a half years, uh, we, uh, we would have savings on choosing electrical solution instead of pneumatic solution. But if we choose, uh, if we change only the cycle time, very little from 1.5 seconds to three seconds. What happens? Then the curve changes and the clear option to, to choose is the actual pneumatic drive. So whenever choosing the, the drive, we have to uh, even using different electrical uh, drives, we should think about the total cost of ownership. We should think about the energy that's going to be used for this drive in the upcoming years. The service time, the, uh, sorry, the service, um, the money that we have to pay for the service, uh, the spare parts that we're going to use. Yes, so not only the, the initial investment, but also how expensive it's going to be in the future. So, Points to remember, if we have small stroke length, big holding force, long holding period, so mm, high cycle time, the more efficient will be the pneumatic drive. If we have a long stroke length and lower holding force and shorter holding period, the more efficient are electrics. But once again, whenever the choice has to be made, uh, it's better to calculate it. Uh, if you cannot do it yourself, ask us. We are here to, ha here to help. Uh, we have um, solutions to answer, answer those questions. Another big subject where there are huge savings 
uh, are blowing applications. So whenever I see blowing applications with open hoses, as, as we can see in the middle here, I can immediately see that you can save tons of money on it. We should use, whenever we have blowing applications, proper nozzles that are connected to the application that we are doing. So any nozzle really is better than an open hose because it's going to be way more uh, energy efficient. It's going to use less air with better results. The other thing to remember is that the application shouldn't work 100% of the time. Should, um, no, maybe it shouldn't work when it's not being used. So we should have some kind of a sensor or maybe even a timer that will power <coughs> I'm sorry that will power the blowing only when it's actually needed so what do we get by using the energy efficiency nozzles we have the same blowing force with lower pressure we've been talking a lot about why the lower pressure in the system uh, is so good for us so with the lower pressure we have lower air consumption we have lower operating costs also while using the nozzles we uh, perform a reduction of the noise they are quieter and easier to work with uh, when they are blowing right next to us and we have uh, better blowing efficiency at the greater distance um, we have better blowing efficiency and a better effect on a distance because the stream of air is um, more concentrated so we can uh, we can perform better uh, on a higher distance but it's not really that popular uh, to maybe no uh, it is popular with people who know about it and it's not popular with people who don't <laughs> uh, so whenever we go to um, our uh, customer sites to uh, while doing the uh, energy efficiency audits we can see situations when the customers are using open hoses and what is sometimes even worse they are using the conduits that should be used as we can see on the right photo uh, for the coolant uh, but sometimes because uh, those are flexible and they are easy to, to maneuver, um, the customers are using them for blowing. And the losses that are happening in um, houses like, like this are um, creating very, very, very big expenses. And here we can see actually one, uh, one um, blowing nozzle that, that, is, that is instant installed in the system, but all the other ones are completely wrong. Festo is not uh, producing the, the energy efficiency nozzles, but we highly recommend uh, using them. And as you can see in here, you can use them in virtually any application. So uh, either it's cleaning, uh, sorting, ionizing, performing an air curtain, drying, and cooling but usually when we are talking about cooling, it's much more efficient to actually use an AC solution. So once again, uh, to talk about situation from the front lines, uh, using hose to cool control cabinet. And it's quite often uh, that we uh, that we see that we we would like to see it less actually, because the consumption of a hose that has holes in uh, in it uh, in this situation um, while <clears throat> after measurement with the flow meter we we would see that it's around 300 liters per minute. So after calculation, it sh uh, shows that it's more than 3,000 euro for year. If we would just buy a proper cooling system for the control cabinet, uh, which costs around 1,000 euro, uh, even with the cost of operation, the return on investment is around 5 
months. So it's a much better solution that uh, will once again generate the, the savings and the savings will multiply uh, in the upcoming months and years. When using the um, blowing applications, once again, we have to think about the realistic application needs. We should restrict the flow and we should restrict the pressure. But there is one more thing that we can actually uh, use in connection with the nozzles, which is pulsation. So uh, I believe last year or two years ago, uh, Festo has created a pulsating valve. Very nice product, I love to use it. Super easy to install, very cheap to buy. What it's actually making is pulsating the air with high frequency um, around from 2 to 10, uh, to 10 uh, hertz. Uh, usually the best results that I have achieved are around 3 or 4. Uh, and it's turning the pressure on and off, on and off, on and off. What we can achieve by this is, as we can see on the top photo, pressure level in an application which is constant and on the bottom photo which is once once again pulsating on and off again that means that we can achieve savings of almost 50 percent so as we can see the mm, 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 the graph in here is filled out uh, in uh, in almost 50 percent uh, after measurements we can we can say it's more than 40 uh, in in here in a real application uh, it was measured to be 47 uh, percent of of saving uh, co comparing it to the to the actual application without pulsation so once again a very cheap um, investment because it's like a few hundred uh, euro for the for the system and we can like that achieve 50 percent decrease in air consumption. If we connect it with the blowing nozzle and with the pressure reduction, it's not impossible to have pressure, uh, to have air consumption reduction by 75%. We have made it in the past. Uh, depending on the application, it's possible. Uh, so once again, very cheap solution that uh, that we can do, but creating huge savings instantly. So I, I love the subjects when, whenever I see um, a blowing application uh, without all of the energy efficiency modules, I'm very happy because I, I actually see that the customer is going to, to save a lot of money during the operation. Another set of applications in which we can create sub substantial uh, savings are vacuum applications. And it's mm, very similar to the topic of, of blowing, but we just uh, act in the other way. So how can we reduce the air consumption in, in vacuum applications? So the easiest thing to do is to get the proper generator to the proper application. That's once again, very similar to the blowing applications. We have to use it when we have to and proper, uh, properly married with the application that we are using it with. So sometimes we can see the old um, vacuum generators from, from Festo made, uh, made of metal. Uh, this is quite an old product which is um, not that popular anymore uh, but we can sometimes still uh, still see that if you are using the the, the old ones please exchange them uh, to the to the new technopolymer uh, versions there are few <coughs> um, 
arguments to, to do so. So the VAD 3.8 uh, is the old version of the new VN30 uh, pressure um, vacuum generator. So as you can see in the graph, the old one was working with the pressure of six bar and achieving vacuum of minus 8.3. Um, uh, bar. But the new version is working with much lower pressure. We are working with four bars and we are achieving greater results. We are achieving minus 0.9 bar of, uh, of vacuum. So instantly much better, uh, much better results with the new, with the new versions. Exactly the same happens with uh, the, um, the other um, ejectors, vacuum generators, but also when it comes to the flow through the, through the generator, not only the pressure. So if we are using VAD18, the flow through the system would be 60 liters per minute at six bar. If we are using the one uh, that is the new version of it, so VN07 on the right graph. Even if we would use six bar through it, then the consumption would be 30 liters, but we don't have to. The better result, the better uh, vacuum, we will achieve by using lower pressure. So at four bar, we are using only 20 liters. So not only we are using lower pressure, but we are using 30% of the airflow that we um, that we would use with the older version. So, if once again keep your eyes your eyes open and use um, newer and much more energy efficient vacuum generators. And of course, with the right pressure for the application, we are not using the system pressure. We are not using the pressure that all of the other components all around are using, we want to use the pressure uh, that um, is actually efficient for the application, um, not higher, not lower, to achieve the best results with the least amount of money lost. Another product which I actually love, this is one of my favorite Festo products because it kind of looks like magic when we are using it, is the energy saving vacuum generator. Uh, not everyone heard about this. Um, it's uh, quite an old product, but uh, it's still my favorite because it works um, by um, whenever it seals, whenever it catches a, a product, uh, it turns off it's not producing uh, vacuum anymore, but it, it has a sensor inside that if the vacuum drops, if we have a little leakage on the suction cup, then it's going to uh, quickly just turn on for just a moment to keep the pressure on the set uh, level that we, uh, that we need. That is a fantastic way of saving, uh, of saving the energy because whenever we ha have the product clamped, we are not um, putting air consumption through uh, through the generator. So this can actually save us incredible amounts of air that uh, that we would normally uh, have to use while carrying some products. And once again, uh, we are talking about lowering the pressure in all of the uh, chapters that we are going through. Once again, we will talk about reducing the cable lengths, because if we have longer uh, cable between the generator and the suction cup, not only uh, our um, applications is working slower, we have to suck up more volume from the from the hose. We are losing uh, pressure. In this case, we are losing vacuum because of the pressure drops uh, in, in, the, in, in the houses. So once again, we are using the shortest 
possible um, hose between the valve and the actuator. It's going to create a lot of um, benefits for uh, for us. Another, once again, super, super important subject that, in my opinion, deserved another uh, chapter is the leakage detection. When we are talking about leakage detection, um, it's a wide subject, but to remember after this presentation, there are a few things. So the average original level of um, leakages is around 30%, but it's a very big, um, um, it's a roundabout number. Um, it is from 10 really to the 70, 80% that we are talking about one week ago uh, in a, a plant that got flooded with water. And after a year, a lot of the ceilings got damaged, a lot of the components got damaged, and there, there were huge losses all around the plant. But by the rule of thumb, we can think that um, the average, uh, average level is around 30%. And it's usually not profitable to go lower than 10%. Then finding the leakages are usually um, consuming more money that we can actually save by repairing this. So uh, we, we are usually lowering the, uh, the level down to around 10. And very important, the biggest 25% is the responsible for the 75% of the losses. So we have to find them all to know, to prioritize which are the biggest, which are creating the biggest losses, but you have to actually act on only the uh, biggest quarter, and then you achieve almost all the results that, 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 that you can. So actually the repair, repair action after the leakage detection is not that big of a deal. It's not that hard uh, to achieve, once again, substantial results and very big savings. And how big are the savings? <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> how big how big are the savings? If we go in the plant from the leakage level of 30% to 50%, the savings for every 100 kilowatt of compressor power is going to be around 15,000 euro. And uh, once again, this is a rule of thumb. It highly depends on the, from system to system, but uh, this was the case um, in my last detection. Um, the customer had beautiful, amazing state-of-the-art uh, compressor room, um, integrated dryers, perfectly designed system, uh, but they never did uh, leakage detection in their lives. So during two days of leakage detection, and not really full days, let, it was more than one and a half, uh, I have found leakages that uh, resulted in um, that um, if were repaired would result in savings of 22,000 euro. To repair all of them, uh, we estimated that it would take uh, around uh, 20,800 euro. So, in <coughs> I'm very sorry. <coughs> I have <coughs> a little cough lately. Uh, so, the payback time of the whole projects of the whole projects about the detection and the repair would be around um, 11 months. So once again, initial investment of 20,000 euro and then 
year by year by year it stays in our pocket we have to remember that um, the leakages are coming and going it's it's a process that that will stay with us all the time so we have to cre uh, make the detection um, regularly and uh, and we have to detect and repair all the all the leakage that that we can but we if we haven't been doing it for years and years and years we should do it instantly uh, because it's going to pay off big time in the uh, upcoming months and years so if in your plant you have leakages that are audible or visible because usually uh the the leakages um you cannot find them by uh, by ear especially if you have a loud production zone we usually use um, either ultrasonic <coughs> uh, uh, devices or it's possible to use um, thermal vision but we uh, all, uh, almost all of the time we use ultrasonic devices um, so if at your plant you have audible or visible sometimes as we can see on in the left picture very old leakages with systems that have bad air quality will leave stains like this so if this um, type this shape of stain is known to you you should immediately think about leakage detection it's going to be uh, create, create instant savings. The return on investment is going to be a few months. So uh, it's very important to think about this subject. And in here we have um, another way of finding the leakages. If you don't have a leakage detection detector, uh, if you are not using leakage detection services, um, a thing that you can do is to regularly inspect the machines and measure the flow through them so whenever we have bigger flow that was estimated in the beginning or measured when the machine was new we know that all of the um, that all of the air that's coming through is going to the leakages during the energy efficiency audits we are using another way of finding the leakages inside of the whole machine so we are uh, comparing the static flow with dynamic flow so the amount of air that the machine is using during the operation and the amount of uh, air that the machine is using while just standing still and not doing anything so this is the result from the company that had the damaged uh, dryer and flooded the uh, the production zone and you can actually see that the results are horrible so we cannot let a machine operate where if it's using 1500 liters per minute for normal operation but out of which more than 1100 liters are just wasted um, but <coughs> Uh, but in in this situation, uh, the the plant had to continue uh, the the operation no matter what. So this is the the cost that they have to calculate in their mm, normal costs of uh, of a operation. We shouldn't let that happen. Uh, we should fight uh, with the leakages. And before that, super important, we will come back to this mm, to take care about our air quality our dryers and our equipment it can create um, losses counted in hundreds of thousands of euro so we have to take care of the of of our system so to sum everything up what we can do now when we go back to our plant when we co go back to our system Keep eyes open for blowing and vacuum applications. If we see open hoses, no nozzles, no pulsation, no pressure reductions, we know in here we can achieve like 70% easy um, savings on blowing. 
when we see uh, vacuum applications with all generators if we go from the all generators to OVM once again 50 60 70 percent of savings are not impossible we shouldn't undermine the cost of leakages because uh, they cost us a lot whether it's uh, a system which is uh, very well set up uh, where the leakages are just say 15 percent it's going to be uh, a, a lot we should keep in mind what is the leakage level in our in our plant we should either have a leakage detection detector all on our own or we should regularly use leakage detection services so once a year on top uh, once every two years to to go through the whole system and to find and then repair the leakages uh, once again starting from the biggest ones we don't have to repair them all at the same time starting from the biggest ones the more problematic uh, the cheaper to repair to have the biggest return on investment that that we actually can it's when we know the situation it's easy to pick the best things to do to cost us not a lot but bring us a lot of money another point to turn off unused machinery and as we were talking it's um, i'm an energy efficiency auditor when it comes to compressed air but of course uh, when we are using electricity this is also once again big saving for us if we turn off the, the machine that are not working for us that are not bringing us money but only costing us money uh, and turning them off is a super simple thing to do we should reduce the unnecessary cable length so once again in the production zone and in the applications we don't want uh, meters and meters of uh, of cables just laying around hanging around and costing us uh, as money keep your eyes open if you see uh, conduits like this just um, uh, make them make them way shorter watch out for broken or waving manometers we were talking about this um, uh, a week ago so if we have a broken manometer the tendency is for the operator uh, to just um, uh, put the pressure at the highest level. So that, then, usually, we are operating on the um, on the system pressure without any um, pressure reduction. If we have waving manometers that are waving to us with the with a needle with the hand so this actually shows big pressure drop during the operation we know that there is not enough air supply to the machine and the machine is fighting whenever the it needs more air whenever the consumption is higher the pressure drops and it disrupts uh, the operation of the machine we should find places like this repair them uh, and um, then repair them by avoiding branching branching reductions or direction changes we should eliminate other choke points in the system and that will lead us to something which is going to bring bring us a lot of money once again lower the pressure levels locally and globally lowering the pressure levels gives us better um, compressor efficiency it gives us lower leakage level throughout the system and uh, it gives us um, savings on the applications because on the we don't have to lower the pressure in the whole system we can also lower the pressure on single applications if we, if we cannot do it globally we should act on it locally and the other thing to to remember and which is also quite uh, 
maybe not easy to do, but something to think about. We should keep the compressor room cold and clean because for every three degrees of heat that we lower the temperature in the compressor room, we are using 1% of energy less. On top of that, with colder air, our dryers work better. Uh, with uh, clean air, we have better um, <clears throat> air quality inside of the system. So we shouldn't use our compressor rooms as a magazine. There shouldn't be anything in uh, that can disrupt the flow uh, in front of the machines. We uh, should have uh, big air intakes with filters inside uh, installed uh, that will not let dirty air come into the compressor room. So whenever we see uh, the compressor room that is being forgotten, that we can see that there is dirt, dust everywhere, uh, we ac actually know that the, that the system is not, the system health, the overall health of the system is not going to be too big. And once again, going back to the dryers, because all of the other topics that we went through uh, are connected with easy, not dangerous energy efficiency, nice savings, and good actions that we can do. But if we are talking about failure of the dryers, if we don't have the redundancy in the system, if you are not ready for the dryer to fail, then it can mean that whenever the dryer fails, we will flood our system with water. So we have to be very wary about that. We have to have an answer ready. If we cannot create a situation when we are, where we are ready, when we know that our dryers can handle um, emergency stop of one of the uh, of one of the dryers and still dry all of the air that com that is coming from the compressors we should at least be ready <coughs> with a company that can provide us with the dryer that will come to us in the shortest possible time preferably in hours in the best solution to be uh, to have the the dryers already in the system that can handle if something goes wrong. If a compressor fails, it's not that bad. We, we just have to then lower our, our consumption. Um, it's, it wouldn't have uh, results accumulating over the years, but if a dryer fails, this is a tragedy. We have to keep it in mind. Uh, we, have to be, we have to be ready. But, those are the things that we can uh, do ourselves, but if you can me cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So when, whenever we have data that we can use, that we can analyze, it gives us better view of what's happening. Because if we are not looking at the whole picture, that then we can focus on activities that are not the most efficient to do. So throughout the system, we can measure a lot of, um, a lot of data, uh, a lot of different points. Uh, and it's very useful to, uh, to have all of this equipment, but usually the equipment is very, very expensive and installation of it is also quite problematic. So if we don't have it, if we don't have the data, if we don't have the people to analyze it, then we are here to help. What I am actually doing at Festo, I'm an energy efficiency auditor uh, doing mostly energy efficiency audits, leakage detections, leakage repairs, and quality control. So what we do is we come into the system for a few days, we perform the measurements, uh, then create a report, and in the report uh, made with ISO uh, requirements and certified by TUV, 
uh, the, the German Institute of uh, Te Technology. Um, what we actually can do after the measurements is to show you easily what are the priorities to act on what are the biggest savings that you can realize with the smallest investment where are the problems in the system yes so if you need help with any of the topics regarding energy efficiency we are here to help you we are ready to uh, for for this demand we are ready for uh, for for the problems that our customers uh, customers have so we are completely open to uh, to help you whenever you uh, need our help you want to ask for uh, some questions maybe you would uh, like to have a um, a little consultation to to talk about the energy systems please come to us come to <coughs> Uh, person responsible for you as a client or directly to to me or my colleague from uh, Festa Energy Saving Serv Services and we will definitely try to help you. So uh, once again uh, the, the audits that we uh, create are um, in conjunction with compressed air mm, norm ISO 11011 and this is a part of energy uh, energy management uh, norm ISO 50001. So whenever you need to um, achieve, um, whenever you have to perform um, an energy management audit, the big one, uh, we can take care of the of the part uh, connected with compressed air we have uh, certifications to do so so once once again either you want to create savings or you have um, pressures to um, operate according to the norm uh, whether they are environmental internal or political once again we are here to help uh, I'm super happy uh, ma making all of the audits, making all of the savings for our clients, because this is um, a service that everyone is happy to perform. I'm super happy to perform it because I, I can actually see thousands of tons CO2 emitted every year less uh, because of my actions and because of our customers' um, cooperation with us. The customer is super happy because the in return on investment is super high. Uh, it's usually months, no longer than a year, to uh, to have your money back um, after after the, uh, the the services, and then uh, it accumulates um, in in the future. So uh, <laughs> once again, I'm here to help. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much for uh, for listening to uh, to the presentations. If you have any questions, then please feel free to ask them uh, either here in the chat, in the email, uh, send them to Alexandru, uh, send them to me. Uh, I will try my best to, to to answer everything to you. So once again, thank you very much, and. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. If not, then thank you so much and hear you next time. Thank you very much for the participation. Thank you very much for the for the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting for, for us. And hopefully that uh, soon we'll have more questions from, uh, from our customers regarding uh, this topic. At this moment, uh, it's the same present, uh, the same question like uh, the last time that we can send them the the presentation by by email. Uh, as far as we talk, uh, it is possible to to be sent. And uh, after uh, these days, that it's uh, Easter in in Romania. Uh, next week we will have send all the all the necessary informations uh, for you to to access. So 
thanks again for participation. Thanks a lot, Z. And have a good day and best of luck in all your work. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure for me. So thank you for the invitation and we hear each other later. See okay. Ya. Ciao. Goodbye, everyone.